Hello and welcome to episode number 34 of the NJ Multispecies Podcast. I am your host, Joe Santiago, with my partner, as always, Chris Pereira, unfortunately. Yep, oh, yep, I'm still here. He's still there. Uh, 34 weeks later, I'm still looking at him, unfortunately. He ruined my whole day today and made me miserable. Uh, getting right into news, a lot of things happened this week. Uh, we got some kind of little trophy because our YouTube channel hit 60,000 views. That's awesome. We thank all of you for that. Uh, we just really started that YouTube channel in October, so uh, awesome. Uh, feedback on Signal 11 was uh, pretty overwhelming. Uh, the phone call that we got from Steve was uh, really unbelievable. Uh, it seems like a lot of people, Chris, uh, it seems like you were right. I guess a lot of people in here do hunt. Because... Uh, I mean, yeah, I, mean, I threw up a, uh, I threw up a poll like on our Instagram reel, which I don't even, I didn't even know you could do that. I'm not sure how it works, but, uh, I threw up a poll. Like, do you just fish or do you hunt and fish? We're genuinely, genuinely curious as to how many people, you know, listening to the show or the, on the mayhem Facebook page or the Instagram page or whatever. Um, curious is the, the numbers. I, I I guessed it was about fifty percent last time I looked at the Instagram reel. It was exactly fifty percent, oddly enough. But uh, I didn't go back and check it yet. But I think we'll put up a poll probably on the Facebook page too, just to honestly see. Well, it seemed well from it. I mean, Steve got a huge outpouring of people asking for information, uh, ordering his stuff, and asking questions. Uh, we got some text messages ourselves on how to use it. Uh, so Steve's come up with the idea we're going to make a couple of shorts on how to use actual, how to actually deploy each product and how to use it. And, um, and you know what else? Um, what else was cool is I already got uh, one or two messages about people who answered that poll, and they said they typed, they sent me a message and said, "Yeah, I only fish, I don't hunt, but I've been thinking about getting into it. I want to try it." And so I think I, I'm going to talk to steve too we could talk to steve uh we should do some kind of introduction to hunting type video uh especially since i just started hunting this past january with you yeah that'd be cool and that's Uh, yeah we're gonna do a lot of things with steve uh and he all obviously ted nugent commented on the podcast page which was uh, made me act like a fangirl all day Sunday. I was dancing around like a leprechaun. Did you have a stain uh, on your pants after that? Not a stain, but I was happy. I mean, he probably watched. Maybe he didn't yet. But yeah, Steve's awesome. Uh, yeah. We're learning slowly that Steve is like the Elon Musk of New Jersey Outdoors. He owns everything. Uh, he now revealed to us he runs the group Flathead Mafia, which has 11,000 members. It's not, it's not Flathead Mafia. Flatty Mafia. Flatty Mafia. Oh, yeah, the Flathead one. What? What is it? Flatty something. It's Flatty Mafia. It's for fluke, not Flathead. Yeah, yeah the fluke fishing. fishing. I'm in the pa- – it's a huge fluke page. Yeah, he runs that too. So another uh, – every time I talk to him, another business pops up that he owns that I know somehow. Yeah, the – the best part is the when you open the text chat with him the other day, you just said, Hey Steve, what's going on? Did you open any more businesses <laughs> between yesterday when we last talked? I did say that. Steve, did, have you opened any new businesses since last time we spoke? Um, Sean Gabagooli, uh, he posted nice bass today. Looks like he finally got back on some nice fish. He didn't work? I don't know. Maybe he went after work. He put some nice fish up. Max just posted a bass on a fly rod about 10 minutes ago, which is really cool. Um, you and Katie had a great day for stripers. It looks like Mikey K and Fast Eddie and Rob Jasonic had a great day for stripers. Uh, Jen Juan is usually... Um, I, I, I want to ask Jen Juan, does he ever go and not catch fish? Uh, he seems to just always catch fish. I know where he fishes, too, in his secret hole. He knows I know where it is, too, and I never catch shit there. Like, I almost died there. I call it the death hole. Uh, Jen, if you're watching, you know I know where your spot is. I, I don't know. It must be that lip glue shit. So uh, I'm, I'm attributing it to that now. Um, 
What else? Uh, Thomas Wyatt. Thomas Wyatt shot a, a nice basket buck down in the Pine Barrens. Um, I've hunted the Pine Barrens because I had the trailer down there. That's that's tough hunting. It's a lot different. It's all flat. Um, all the trees look the same. It's like it's sand instead of dirt. So they don't. Make, it's very weird. I heard uh, you can't eat those deer because it tastes like pine tar, though. There are, there are, there is a pineish taste to to the turkey meat and the deer meat, but you could still get through that. But it's hard. It is hard. Uh, so congratulations, to Thomas Wyatt, on his buck. Uh, I know that that's not that easy to do to get one down there in the Pine Barrens. Is this uh, kind of is this kind of your way of apologizing to him for getting uh, under his skin about the? I Bad think he, I think he took that kind of the wrong way. Thomas Wyatt, I consider to be uh, a, a multi-species fisherman, first of all, because he constantly is posting different things. Uh, he travels up to New York to the to tr- chase different fish. Where did he just? He went to Thousand Islands. I mean, the comment really was not directed at Thomas Wyatt at all. I, I, he would be considered in like the category of us of like what we do. I don't know why he took that. Uh, I don't know, whatever, but he took that the wrong way somehow that the other guy, the uh, Garrett, uh, river gnome said that I had somehow like said, he only catches small fish in the last episode, which that wasn't my point either. I mean, uh, I go bluegill fishing. Like uh, people make fun of me on the internet all the time. I don't care. What What does it matter? I don't give a shit. Who cares? I don't know. I mean, uh, I have people take things the wrong way sometimes, but uh, I mean, it's like we said, I, I think the point was that in the case of Garrett, he's doing what he wants to do. Right. And I think that was about there. What There's a, like, like I said in the text argument we were having, like the word slab is always used kind of freely. I don't know where you draw the line on using the slab. I know he got some blowback for using the word slab on some fish that maybe some people thought weren't slabs. I mean, but, who cares what people think? I, well, yeah. It, it, you're right. Who does care what people think? Uh, if you're watching this, continue to uh, just post your fish. Don't worry about trolling. Yeah, if I mean, if, if you want to prove to someone the length of a fish, throw it on a ruler. I mean, if not, then who cares? And who cares what anyone thinks, honestly? I, when yeah. you do pull out, once you pull out a picture with a uh, fish on a once you pull, uh, pull out a picture of a fish uh, on a ruler, the argument's over. I mean, it's done. Right, and that's why if, if I, if that's my intent, like I want to document this large fish i'll i'll throw it on a ruler real quick take a picture of it and i just have it but it's i would like to, anyway i would like to just say all those guys that got offended by that somehow uh it wasn't offensive uh at all i can they're all multi-species uh fishermen i was ripping mike ike and ellie not you guys uh this is all coming from a guy who gets offended at things he shouldn't get offended at sometimes too so take it with a grain of salt <laughs> Depends what the subject is. Our All guest right. tonight, uh, interestingly enough, is a tog fisherman. Uh, he's one of the better known tog fishermen in the state of New Jersey. Um, Chris, I, I don't know if you want to do this introduction. Yeah, I mean, he's written dozens of articles for magazines about tog fishing, done instructional videos. If if you tog fish, if you've ever looked on the internet and tried to learn about tog fishing i can almost guarantee you've seen a video of frank doing some kind of instruction of it how to set up a rig how to do i guarantee you a lot of people know tog fishing is one of my favorites and uh, i'm real excited about this i'm going to try to not go too long because i know i could we're going to be able to talk to frank for forever about tog fishing but uh Let's go ahead and, and get him in here. Okay, so we were able to get the guest in easier than usual. Uh, this man, as Chris just pretty much said, he's been uh, fishing New Jersey for about 57 years. 
one of the best well-known black fishermen in the state of New Jersey. We have Frank Mahalik on tonight. Frank, what's going on? Hey, how are you guys? Frank, nice to have you on. Awesome, I know, Joe. Uh, Thanks Chris for having has, us, Joe and Chris. Chris has been uh, dreaming about this episode for weeks. The- Oh, and I'm, gl- I'm glad you're here, so I don't Frank. have to hear ma- hear about this anymore. Frank, I I know you love tog fishing. I love tog fishing. You do it significantly more than me, and you've been doing it for even more significantly longer than me. Uh, I consider myself, you know, still novice at it. Uh, I mean, I like to think I, I'm learning more every year and getting better at it and better, but. Uh, Man, some some of the, like I mentioned before, some of the instructional videos, uh, I've learned a lot from from things you have on the internet, either through articles you've written for magazines or instructional videos you have on on YouTube and such. Appreciate that. I try no. I try really hard to to just share information. You know what I mean? This is information that was really hard fought. I mean, when I was when I was a young guy just learning how to blackfish, it was a whole different world ago. It was it was like in the eighties, man. <laughs> like you know, <laughs> I was on boats that don't even exist anymore, and and the gear that we used was just a whole different ball game, you know. And since then, you know, you get married, you have a kid. My kid played hockey for like ten years. He played ice hockey at a very high level. During those years, I had so much money going to ice hockey that all my black fishing was all in the backwater behind Margate and Longport from my, you know, from a 22 foot center console. And I really got very good at the inshore black fishing thing, but I always loved to, to fish on the wrecks, you know, to fish out at the reef sites for bigger blackfish. When the kid got done playing hockey and it was time for me to start getting more in the wreck fishing again, I'm lucky enough to have some excellent black fishermen as friends that I was able to call up Joe Zagorski and, and have a conversation with him and like, Joe, catch me up. What, you know, what kind of gear are you using? What kind of rod, what kind of reels, what kind of line? And, you know, the rigs and like Joe was kind enough to bring me up the speed because I was basically, I stopped wreck fishing for black fish and I was playing around with these little fish in the back where you know, if you if you see an eight pounder back there, that's like enormous. That's like the yeah. biggest fish I ever saw caught back there was like eight. So, as you guys know, it's a completely different world fishing in the back bay, back bay versus you know being on a wreck in a hundred foot of water. Well, and even you fish pretty deep South Jersey a lot of the time, mm-hmm. uh, whereas I'm fishing the Sandy Hook Reef, North Jersey a lot of the time. Even the difference between those two fisheries seems like night and day a lot of the times. Definitely. And one of the things that I try to do, you know, you kind of have to pick and choose what you do. Getting into these charters, uh, I work with my friend, Mark Jadstad, where Mark will charter, I'll charter a boat every Saturday and Mark will charter it every Sunday. Right out of the bat, it's me and Mark and Sully on every Saturday and me and Mark and Sully on every Sunday. So this way, half the charters are mine, half the charters are his, but we always fish together on the on the whole weekend. It can be really tough at times when the weather is nice and all the trips go, but that's a reason why, too, when I'm fishing a lot like that, that's why I'm fishing down south because my family has a shore house in Ventnor. So I can fish in Ventnor. It's right south of Atlantic City. I can sleep there. I can be at Cape May in 40 minutes. So when we get off the boat, I can be back at the house, have dinner, and, uh, you know, I'm chilling out by 6 o'clock at night. I can go to sleep, wake up at 4 the next morning, and I'm all ready to go again. Whereas if I have to drive all the way back to Sewell to my normal house, like near Turnersville, it's an hour and a half from Cape May. So by me staying at the Ventnor house and fishing down south, I actually have two extra hours sleep every night to recover if I do get two or three trips going in a row. Does that make sense? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, yeah, I've I've done the double book. Like when when we travel, like if, if I want to fish for white sturgeon in the Columbia River, mm-hmm. if I only book one trip 
and the weather cancels it, it, it just ruins my whole year. Right. Right. If I book two, then I have a better shot of going at least once. But if I have to go twice <laughs> now, I'm now I'm really suffering. I got to try to I got to try to find a way to to uh, get my sleep or get some kind of rest or get a power up or something. But uh, absolutely. You got to find a way to salvage it, you know. And I mean, this way, if both trips get canceled, I'm cool. Me and the wife go to the shore for the weekend. You know, we, we have a nice time. But basically from from November like 17th until January 17th, I literally have a charter every Saturday and Sunday. Um, I think Christmas Eve, Christmas Day, New Year's Eve, New Year's Day, I don't. But like after New Year's Day, I have like three days in a row where I'm on fish and fever. The same thing happens like that second week and right after New Year's to after New Year's and after Christmas, I have like three days in a row where I'm on fish and fever. And because I know mid January, it, it's going to fizzle out like it's going to go from good to bad yeah. really quick. Yeah. And one of the main reasons why I'm fishing so far south is number one, because it works for me. But I'm fishing down south. I'm fishing the same waters as the boats that are fishing out of Indian River Inlet are fishing. We're usually, you know, we're fishing Delaware reefs and such. So it, it it's infinitely more productive when you get down south a little later on in the year where you guys know, I mean, up north, the, the fishing's good. And then all of a sudden it's not, you know, we get a little snow inshore. Um, you know, the Manasquan and the Raritan Shark River, you get a big push of cold water coming out. All of a sudden it knocks the fish off for three or four days and it it makes it really difficult. So, like I said, it just so happens down south it works for me to to get the fish a little bit later that way as well. What yeah. do you what do you think caused the like of all the species that are out there, what caused this obsession with blackfish for you? For me personally or for everybody? For you, I mean, I know for everyone, it's just they're just going to say the tug is the drug. What it, we all know that, but for yeah, for you personally, no, no. Look, let Frank answer for him personally, and then I'll have my own answer. And I don't know if you do too, well, but I, I, bet have you're all own, little bit I have my own answer for that as well. I think a lot of guys got into it when striper fishing got kind of crappy. You know, there were a few years there where surf fishing was really, really bad. And all of a sudden, everybody started, oh, I need to go catch a fish. All of a sudden, they're hopping on a blackfish boat. But also, with the internet nowadays, I mean, we see double-digit we see double digit blackfish. I mean, how many friends do you guys have on Facebook? Say 900, maybe 1,000? Too, too many. So out of your 1,000 friends, zero. how Chris many of them go blackfishing on the weekend? You know, maybe we have like... 30 guys black fishing on the weekend. So when you see four or five double digit blackfish coming up, it, it almost looks unrealistic. It's almost like you lose respect for them. You go out there and put them on your line. Let me know how you make out because it's a whole different ball game. Well, I'll tell you what, I could tell you why I think a lot of guys, it's not that they don't like fishing for blackfish. I think a lot of guys can't handle the weather when it's black fishing season here in New Jersey. <laughs> yeah. That's what I think first off. And cause I honestly, I don't know who could go black fishing and not love it besides dealing with the weather. That's about the only downside. I kind of would prefer that weather to sweating my ass off. Oh, me too. I don't, I, the, I remember fit when I was, I, I'll have to ask my father about this cause I don't know his reasoning behind it, but I, I do remember being a little kid fishing with my dad, uh, sunny fishing or whatever the hell we were doing. I remember saying, dad, what's the heart? My dad was a big saltwater guy. He didn't like fresh water, but dad, what's the hardest fish to catch? And I always, rem oh, blackfish, blackfish is by, by far the hardest fish to catch at the time he said that i didn't even know what a blackfish was uh but i would have to make him you know i got to find out what made him say that but that stuck with me uh for my whole life i found them to be challenging since the day he said that mm -hmm. yeah i mean and it's not just the weather and when you say it's just so Let's just to bring in a freshwater fish, let's say a musky, right? You can go musky fishing. I don't, do, you, do you do a lot of freshwater fishing, Frank? No. No. Have you ever been musky fishing? No. Good for you, Frank. Don't ever go. And if you ever hear of a guy named Mark Madusky, don't just ignore him. 
I know a few guys that are real into it. <laughs> oh, I'm not. So, I'm not. <laughs> I'm so dedicated into the salt water thing. And I mean, I have a very simplistic way I go about my life, honestly. And I kind of get a kick out of this because I hear these things from different people. For me, I read a book when I was in grade school. It was from Gail Sayers. He used to be like a running back for the Chicago Bears years ago. It was called yeah. I Am Third. And the premises of the book was God is first, my family second, and I'm third. And that's it, man. I mean, I hear guys are like, oh, yeah, I go fishing every day. and My wife has to get used to it. And I'm like, bro, you're going to be divorced. You're not going to have a family. You're not going to have to worry about a wife. You can go fishing all you want. You think you're some kind of badass fisherman? Like, wh whatever, really. For me, that's how I, you know, that's how I roll. Like, God is first, my family is second. If that's good, I get to go fishing all I want. I think Frank just told me I fish too much. He did. <laughs> I think Frank just said me and him are a little jealous of you in one way and not in another. No, no, uh, Frank. But... Let me. Let me, can I? I, I got to ask Frank one question. Uh, uh, another question. Okay. Uh. Now, I'm a guy, Frank. I don't really kill many fish. You could ask Chris. I really practice catch and release with almost everything. Uh, the blackfish falls into such a uh, touchy subject because it's so amazingly delicious, but yet they take so long to grow. Uh, it's pro I think it is the slowest growing fish, isn't it, Chris? Can I ask you how long, how long do you think they take to grow? I know that they're slower than smallmouth, and I think smallmouth take 10 years, maybe 8 to 10 years to get to 23 inches, I think. Well, we, Sully caught a new state record blackfish a couple years ago on fishing fever. It was 25.8 pounds. It was 26 years old. So it grows about, it grows about, wow. and, it was, and it was about the same inches. So they grow roughly a pound per year. This blackfish was older than Max and Kevin Cool. <laughs> so be it. But my point is, there again, a lot of people of, oh, the drama. Oh, you killed a dinosaur. It's like, dude, you don't know what you're talking about. Don't tell me what I killed. If it's my fish, I'll take it out and stab it if I want to. It's my fish. You worry about your fish. I'll worry about mine. I love to release everything that I can. And on our charters, personally, we always try to let anything over like seven pounds. We want to let it go if it'll go. Um, we let all the females go that we can. We don't even want to keep the females. Like we're not there to fill our fish up with up with uh, fillets. But at the same time, I don't really think it's mentally healthy for anybody to be telling somebody else on the other side of the screen what they should catch or what they should release. I think that's like mentally defunct, to be honest with you. As, lo as long as they're following the game laws and oh, taking sure. legal. Absolutely. Yeah. 100%. I got to totally, yeah, totally agree with you on that. I I've said something similar in the past. You know, basically, I said this. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm catching and releasing most things, even if I'm pan fishing, if I'm pan fishing for perch and I'm there to catch a certain amount of perch because I want a, enough fillets to eat a couple of times, I'm still throwing the bigger ones back, like the, the mm -hmm. significantly larger ones, I'm still putting them back. They're worth more in the water than they are on your plate, even if you're, go even if you want to eat them. We all like yeah, to eat and fish. And they don't even... And they do lose, no matter how much you care for them and you bleed them and you wash them in salt water, they still lose a little something once they're frozen. You know, they, they're not oh, quite yeah. as good oh, as yeah. when they're fresh. And, and, and the okay. much bigger <coughs> the much bigger ones also don't taste as good as the smaller ones anyway. And that goes for almost any fish except everything. tuna. Yeah, everything. Absolutely right. But we had a girl, we had a female angler, uh, Heaven and L Outdoors. I don't know if you know her. Uh, she's a big, t uh, pretty much land based tog fish angler from, uh, she's from like Manasquan, right? Um, she, she like, there, yeah. she was basically telling us about this entire like blackfish, black market mafia that's down there in the canal, uh, yeah. just constantly cycling these fish out to a car that runs them to a market uh all the time she going said it's on not, for years yeah she said it was one of the most highly exploited fisheries and the fish probably in new jersey that's the most in danger of uh becoming in trouble next 
uh, see, they're very accessible. They're accessible to people on land, and that's what makes them really touchy. But I've seen it. I mean, I know guys. I would be fishing at a at a bridge in Margate, and it was like a half hour before high tide. There would be this little fourteen foot tri hull with like six guys on it. They would come over, tie off to the bridge. They would all fish until the tide turned. When slack tide was done, they had all their little fish and they were going back and they were going to work for the rest of the day. And they did it every day. If high tide was at 6 a.m., they were there. If it was at 12, 12 noon, they were there. It's like they played that game so good. Yeah. And obviously they were keeping everything, everything that oh, you saw go in the boat. So, so. What would you say and what you've actually seen over the 57-year career you've had in the current, uh, like, fish population and fishing action? How is it at current date in your, from what you've seen over the years? Yeah, we've heard a lot of, sorry, we heard a lot of guys, that com- they complain that the fishing, all oh, the fishing used to be better, fishing used to be better. You think it's the same for blackfish in general? No, I think there's a lot more fishermen fishing for them now. Um, because of the advent of better quality tackle, there's also a lot more boats that are that are fishing for them now because of things like spot lock. I mean, please, I go fishing with Jerry Pastorino on the fishmonger. What, Jerry sets two anchors and comes back exactly on the spot on the piece he wants to. There's a guy who comes over with a spot lock, hits a button, and he's sitting there. And that's all well and good, and he thinks he's a black fisherman today. But when the wind kicks up and it's blowing 15 and all of a sudden there's three footers and his spot, his spot lock motor's not working, he doesn't have the skill to set two. He doesn't even have two anchors. He doesn't have the no. skill or wherewithal to set two anchors. And he doesn't even know the spot within the spot. And what I mean no. that is you don't just go up and land on a wreck and you're catching fish. I was talking to um, Tom Daffin. We, I fish with Tom a lot. And we were on this one spot. And on this one spot, he was always anchoring on the eastern side of the wreck. And I, I had the, after a couple of times he was on this piece, I said, Tom, how come, is it my imagination or are you always staying on this eastern half of this wreck? He goes, no, it's not your imagination. And I looked at him and if you know Tom, he just kind of turned his head and looked away. And I said, well, you going to tell me? <laughs> and he said, um, he said, yeah. He said, when this clam boat went down, the bow was facing east. He said, "On the stern of the boat, the clam cages and the and the dra- and the drag, the trawl is still on the back of the boat." He said, "There's blackfish that live in those cages that are so big, you'll never get them out." He said, "They're far and far and beyond new record, but you'll never get them out because they're so big. They live inside the cages and they can't get out of the cages. If you do hook one." It's like instant break off. So there's no, and, and my point is, if you get on that one spot of the wreck, you're just wasting your time because you're going to break off big fish. You're going to kill the bite on the whole wreck. Where if you go over here, where if you if you give these fish a chance to move out of the structure and get in there and find the baits, you can get some tremendous fish. But that's what I mean when I talk about the spot within the spot. Jerry Passerino is the same. Jerry Jerry visualizes the bottom better than anybody i've ever seen particularly when he's fluke fishing he lines up a fluke drift like like it's nobody's business he's just absolutely the man what a pleasure to fish with him pastor the pastor you know me and chris were one time right out there out in front and uh we were on a 35 foot boat trying to figure out how to use an automatic anchor to go black fishing and we were like struggling to like it get the boat anchored. It wasn't our boat. It was, it it was, was well we don't have a boat, but we yeah. were trying. Pastorino pulls up and like within two minutes there's like three anchors out, like set and everyone's <laughs> fishing. Like we're still staring at the thing. I'm saying this guy can't be for real. He's twenty he, it, it was unbelievable. He's impressive to watch. He is just I, he is impressive. And if you think I he's think impressive to watch from far you should be on the boat watching what he does day after day, week after week, season after season, because he's he's just as excellent as fluke fishing as he is at black fishing as he is at sea bass fishing. He's an extremely talented guy. Frank, first of all, don't tease us. It's impossible to get on Jerry's boat. I've <laughs> I've tried ever since I was I fished with Jerry one time. 
and I said, I said, this is the best captain I've ever fished with. Mm -hmm. And not just the fishing. I mean, he's just the most pleasant guy you could ever want to fish with. Cause a lot of these captains are great at fishing, but they're, you know, I, they're kind of, they could be a-holes. Just to be honest, some of them. And Jerry's the total opposite. He's, he was, it was a sea bash trip. It was actually a trip that I won years ago and it was a sea bash trip. And, uh, you know, obviously we crushed sea bass. I mean, everyone caught their limit as a boat limit, as many sea bass as you could want. Nice big ones. He stayed at the helm the whole time controlling the boat. And this was a free trip. He, they were only making tips off of this trip and I've never seen someone work so hard. It was the craziest thing I've ever seen. He was the most pleasant guy to f- captain to fish with I've ever I we, are, we are having a communication problem with Posturino because oh, Jerry was he, supposed to come on the show. Jerry, Jerry think, he's not, he thinks I'm a woman, and he thinks Chris <laughs> is a guy named Frankel. Uh, he's very, I don't know what happened, but like something happened between us and Jerry that just became very confusing. <laughs> He was he was supposed to come on the show back when we first started doing it, uh, and then I th- I guess he forgot the one night, and then he was busy, and then he's been busy. whatever. It doesn't matter, but uh, but then he messaged you like, "Hey, Frankel." <laughs> that part I don't. That part I'm not sure. <laughs> I, I know oh, he yeah, likes he, to go to the bar with other captains and relax. It might have been during that. He is away. Very impressive. Frank, for the people that are watching uh, that want to, you know, get into your stuff, what do you recommend if if someone was going out to buy their first black fishing jigging setup? Like, could you recommend a rod length and weight? Well, the first thing you should ask is about do do you like to jig for black fish, or are you one of the guys that likes to use a bait rig, bait fish kind of more traditional way? What's your take on that first? I'm extremely proficient at catching black fish no matter where I'm fishing. The the tackle and gear has to match the conditions of where we're fishing. And what I mean by that is if you're fishing in the back bay behind Margate under the Margate Bridge, when the tide's running, you need to use an eight to get to the bottom. And it's blowing back a little bit in the current. So obviously there's no way you can fish a jig back there. When right. you go out to the reef site, it's almost like you're fishing in a pond where you, you drop a one, one and a half ounce jig and it goes right to the bottom. So it, it can, it's very conducive to fishing a jig out there, but it really depends on what side of the boat you're on. And what I mean by that is if I'm fit, if the, if the anchor's tight and if the boat's sitting this way and, and we're square on the piece, but if I'm dropping my bait in here, but the bottom current is pushing me sideways where my crab with a 10 ounce weight is going down and it's getting pulled a little bit underneath of the boat. I'm not the guy that should be fishing a jig. I shouldn't be fishing a jig here. I should be fishing a jig on the other side. You see what I'm saying? So it has to do with whether I can move around the boat, whether I want to fish a jig or not. I prefer to use really um, like a Daiwa BGMQ 4000 size reel for, for jigging blackfish. Um, 20 pound Iowa J braid eight line will get it done for me. As far as rods, we can get it. I'm really spoiled when it comes to rods because I, I design I design rods with Century. So I like the Century um, weapon mag taper. It's it's just a badass rod. I've seen uh, I've seen fish over 18 pounds caught on that rod, and it didn't even look like it had much of a like much of a bottom to it. I've caught What's black drum length? 60. Huh. What's the length on the jigging rod? That one's 710. Okay. 7 foot 10 inch. I've caught 65 pound black drum on that rod with, with no problem. I okay. used a, um, a Tsunami Saltex 5000 reel and really, you know, really put it to them. Really, I was, one time I was using a lighter reel and I actually like broke the reel foot off. I mean, you know, I kind of had to step up my reel game, but like no kidding, 65 pound black drum beat the hell out of them. Right. It's a really nice rod. Tsunami makes some nice rods. Black Hole makes some nice rods. Um, the Challenger, the Black Hole makes a rod. It's called a Challenger. It's a seven foot. I think it's an L. The L is is the one that we like with that. But I find the tip on that rod, the tip isn't quite soft enough. It doesn't. Whereas I usually fish 
I usually fish jigs like one, one and a half ounces. And I want to, I want the tip. I want the tip just, just to give just a little tiny bit. And when I get a hit, I want it to be able to, to feel it. Whereas a certain rod that's a little too stiff, the rod will tend to, it'll tend to bounce like this. It won't bounce like, like, the, you know, the tip won't give. Yeah. It'll be more like it's bending like a foot back from the tip. In that situation, it's a, it's a little, you know, it's a matter of preference. What do you like? So uh, you might just tell me I'm nuts for this, but so I've never, I love black fishing. I don't do it as often as I was li- I would like, but I do it a fair amount, but I've never bought myself like a designated blackfish rod, like something that would meet the specifications that you would pick for you know for black fishing and And you don't have to it's fine so what i use if i'm able to use a if i'm able to use a jig if the conditions allow me to use a jig i'm always trying to use a jig if if i can and i you i actually use a it's a saint croix rod it's a mojo bass uh like a pitching rod like that a that a professional bass Mm -hmm. fisherman would use to pitch a jig into heavy cover and mm-hmm. rip a bass out of. And I use that with a low profile bait caster reel and I hold the line on my finger. And I know almost everyone uses a sp- spinning gear and obviously uh, a blackfish specified rod. And I feel like I've done pretty well using this setup. It, it's, it's sensitive. I've, I like the way it feels. Like, and I feel like I'm a weirdo, but it works for me somehow. I feel like you I'm, are a weirdo. Dude, the first time I saw a guy black fishing, I mean, this is a guy, this is an insanely skilled guy. Okay. Insanely skilled guy. His name's Nick Tenero. Nick was using a little small mouth rod. It was like a five and a half foot long Loomis rod and some little tiny spinning reel. The white crabs were like jello. They were so molted. They were like mush. He was taking this little three quarter ounce jig that he poured and he was putting like a, a claw on it. It was like a pile of pudding and throwing it out. And he was smoking blackfish. I mean, like I never saw. And again, Nick is not, Nick is like superhuman. He's he's an insanely talented guy. But you know, he's using this little smallmouth rod and having his way with him. That was the day when I learned what black what jigging blackfish was. It's it's also a moniker. Jigging blackfish. It basically only means you're using a jig to take a piece of bait to the bottom. Yeah. You're not jigging per se, like jigging. And right. some people, you know, they don't realize like when you're black fishing. You don't want to be bouncing your bait off the bottom. You just, right. you just, it's, it's not good for you getting bites. You know what I mean? It's not good for anyone near you. <laughs> you read that? <laughs> I think it might have been one of your videos a while back. It was. I believe it or not, I was. Sometimes when I need to really clarify something, and I've been doing this for for some time. But I'm never the guy to stand up and beat my chest and say, I'm the end all beat all and I know it all. There's times when I need to clarify things like when I was when I read an article that was written from another guy and it was a pretty, pretty, you know, good guy. But he actually wrote down, oh, this is the Belmar rake. And what he had was he had a piece of like 50 pound mono with a dropper loop on it. And he put a put the hook inside the dropper loop and he locked it on and he was I was like. No, that's not the Belmar rig. I actually had to call Jerry and say, Jerry, I don't mean to be stupid, but I need to be really accurate here. Is this the Belmar rig? Because the Belmar rig is actually a method of, like when you take your top shot, when you take your braid and you tie it on the like 60 pound Andy Mono, like I used, the yeah. Belmar rig means you take like the bottom two feet of line, you tie it with like a two turn spider hitch. So you double up your line, you hang your sinker from the bottom. And then you take your double line right above your sinker and you loop it and you loop your rig into it. And then you take your double line and you tie two double overhand knots. It's a way of attaching your leader hook into your main line with brutal strength, brutal strength, very dependable, very rarely breaks off. But when my point is, when I speak about things like this, sometimes I have to go into the memory banks, too, and check with Jerry 
or I have to call Joe Zagorski or I have to call Tom Daffin. And I, I need to make sure I know what I'm talking about because I don't want to I don't want to say something trying to pass information along if I'm not passing it along and it's incorrect information. Right. My man, man, my man of squan fishing uh, strategy is usually a good set of binoculars and fine posturino. Uh, that's come out of the come out of the inlet, enter the ocean, get the binoculars, and find Jerry and head that's towards. That's why he doesn't want to talk to you. That could um, be yes. Hashtag follow the green boat. Follow <laughs> the green boat, and I, and still I can't find him ever. It, it, you know what? It, it, in in all honesty, though. It's kind of like the catch twenty two of of being a charter boat captain and being that good, right? Like people know what you look like, they know what the boat looks like. You know, if if they see you out there and they're not finding any fish all morning, and all of a sudden they see you, they're gonna come check it. out. It's just you know, it is what it is. It's reality. That's really. true, but in reality, they everybody everybody wants to be that guy. Everybody yeah, wants to be that guy, but how come nobody else is that guy? Well, it's like what you said before, right? You you could he could he could anchor the boat for you, and still doesn't mean you're you, and then leave, and it still doesn't mean you're going to do anywhere near as well as him. I've yeah. learned so much f- from from fishing with him. L- sm- the tiniest, smallest details, and on certain days I'm out there, and I'm I usually on his boat. I usually fish next to the engine box right to where the cabin ends i I like to fish next to the house up towards like the front of the pulp of the front of the cockpit and Mm. one day i was on the i was on the the starboard side of the boat right behind jerry and we had a rough morning in the morning we were up north and it just wasn't happening there was a bad current but jerry recognized the situation with the current and he knew why we weren't getting bit so we we fished for like a couple hours. It was like eight eight thirty. He's like, "This isn't working. Reel him up. We're taking a ride." We reeled him up. He he drove like twenty miles, got anchored up on this reef site, and it was like destructo bite. It was like crazy, <laughs> insane black fishing. And I was right there next to Jerry, and we were. I saw what he was doing, and I took what he learned, what I learned from him. And we were both doing it, and it was it was just so cool to be part of something that he shared with me, and we were both having a great day because of it. Does that make sense? Yeah, it um, does. Yeah. And I've been on too many boats with too many captains that, in that same similar or similar situation, they'll just kind of say something like, oh, yeah, we just got to wait for the tide. We're going to sit here and wait out the tide. And then the tide changes. But the fishing doesn't change. And they're like, oh, the fish just aren't biting today. Oh, it happens. I know who you're talking about. And 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 you know what? And it's just like, to me, that's unacceptable. It's, you know, I don't know. I, Me and Joe, Joe and I do a lot of uh, freshwater fishing too. And to me, a lot of, a lot of saltwater fish, like you can run into a, a you're going to run into blitzing stripers, let's say, a lot more often than you're going to see it, that kind of feeding situation in freshwater. Mm-hmm. And so to me, black fishing has all those things that, that we like about freshwater, like almost like a, like a finesse walleye bite or something, Joe, I don't know if you agree. Almost kind of like, well, you, I was just going to, gonna, I was, I was going to actually ask Frank when it comes to the actual jig itself, is I mean every tackle shop obviously just has the generic same color football jig sitting there on the counter. Is there any reason to get fancy with the jig or just grab anyone off the counter? I like glow is really good sometimes. Uh, I really prefer a color it looks like black muscle because. All right, we're going to get in this thing. Here we go. You ready? Is that like the is that like the did, black one, the orangish, purplish yeah. color? It's like a Joe triggered black another black gold. Joe triggered, triggered another guest. Here we go. But oh god, blackfish jigs. You need a good hook. Okay, you need a really good hook. You need to have a shape that you like. Dante's magic tail jigs are really good. Hearst jigs are good. Um, Dominic Lomano makes these jigs up north. Really good stuff. I was fishing with my buddy Mark and Sully, and they brought two guys with us, and we were on. 
we were on Allison's Nightmare out of Cape May. It was like it was like the third week in January. Okay, but we're going to talk about color for just a minute. I'm going somewhere. Okay. And we're out there, and this guy's on the back of the boat. And he's a good fisherman, good fisherman. According to Mark, he gets he gets on a lot of boats. He goes out with a lot of other people, and he's a good fisherman. Well, me and Mark and Sully, we're very close together, so we do a lot of the same things. One of the things we all do is we paint our sinkers red. I paint my sinkers with red plastic dip that I, I have it. I learned from Joe Zagorski. And here's the reason why. That guy, he's on the back of the boat. Now, it's we're all using white crabs. We're all fishing the same way. And he's kind of making fun of us. He's like, oh, I'm using green crabs. I'm doing great. Said, what, you don't have to use those white crabs. I'm like, it's okay. Do your thing. And then he starts on and then he starts giving Mark hell about the red sinkers. And so in the meantime, he's kind of giving Mark hell, but he's kind of kind of making fun of me because I'm, the, you know, I kind of we got into the red sinker thing altogether. So about a half an hour later, he starts catching dogfish and he's catching dogfish and dogfish after dogfish after dogfish after dogfish for about for about the next four hours. Oh, in the meantime, I'm fishing on the port side next to the house, and I kind of got hot. I had my own little bike going, and I started smoking them. Before you know it, I'm pulling up like six, seven pound blackfish, and I'm unhooking them, and I'm throwing them down the gunnel <laughs> on the floor so I hit his feet. So he knows <laughs> I'm catching these fish, and he's catching dogfish after dogfish after dogfish. So he doesn't say, he gets kind of quiet, and we shut him up, and, and all of a sudden we're catching fish. And we get back to the dock, he goes, oh, Frank, you're a nice guy, pleasure fishing, well, you're a really good fisherman. I'm like, oh, I get lucky, I got lucky today. He goes, oh, no, you're really good. I'm like, I, th I think you're a lot better than me, I just got lucky. I said, but you know what? I said, you made fun of the red sinkers? I said, I didn't want to say, because obviously you know what you're doing. I said, but you were using shiny new sinkers all day. And every time you would feel a bite and you would miss the fish, I said, if you got a blackfish bite and you miss a fish, you lifted up the shiny sinker off the bottom and you moved your bait and then it went to the bottom and you had a dogfish, didn't you? And he just looked at me and he went like, and I was like, <laughs> yeah. I said, nice fishing with you. Just <laughs> Wait, but what, what, got them, what, is the, what does the red sinker do? The red, red is the color that disappears first in the water column. Okay, yeah. so when red is going underwater, it reaches like 15 feet and it turns into like a dull gray. You can't see red underwater. It's also flat. It's not shiny red. It's flat red. So it's not shiny. So it's basically it. blending in. Why aren't our why aren't our weights red? Well, okay. So here's what I was. Gonna, so Shh, I was don't just tell there. anybody. Uh, Nobody knows. Frank, Frank, you're you're on a podcast. <laughs> You're no, on YouTube, but, Frank. I I was at the Sporting Life a couple of weeks ago, the local tackle shop here, and uh, I was grabbing some uh, some blackfish gear, and I was digging through his. He had, you know, he has the bucket of sinkers, and I'm digging through them, and I I think he was kind of like, "Are what weight? What size are you looking for? Maybe I could help you. You've been digging in there for a while." I was digging through trying to find like the crappy black brown sinkers so that not the shiny ones. I didn't want the shiny ones, but I, but I, again, probably because I watched maybe one of your videos or read one of your articles that mentioned it, but, uh, I, I haven't painted them red. I don't know if just the dull ones get the job done in that. That'd situation. be just as fine. Honestly, if I, I I have so many sinkers in my garage, but if I, I mean, I was at the shore yesterday, I could have done it. If I lived down there, I would fill a bucket up with salt water. I would throw my lead sinkers in there for a couple of weeks and I would take them out and let them dry and they would be all dull and nasty and I wouldn't paint yeah. them. But the fact that I live an hour from salt water, when I get them, I paint them with the red plastic dip and I'm good to go. Does that make sense? Yeah, I'm yeah. so I'm so mind blown by this red thing. I'm still like ten minutes behind on you guys here. You like need I'm, to go. You need to go on Google and type in Frank Mahalik uh, tog fishing, and just go into the. So you take he, he takes the, to, he like, takes the, he takes those circular like puck shaped weights we're using and paints them red, like the coffin shaped one. You like the coffin shaped ones or like the yeah. flat ones. Flat bank sinkers and ten. Usually, I use tens. Yeah, I, I paint them with the I paint them with the spray plastic dip. 
Just, so here, here's a question though, but just jumping off of that. So you're, you want that sinker to be as hidden as possible, as inconspicuous as possible. But when you, you said your favorite blackfish jig color was glow, which would be the opposite. Glow until dogfish come around. When dogfish ah. are around, don't use glow beads. Don't use green. Don't use red. Don't use any beads because the dog it attracts the dogfish. Now, when the water gets really cold and most of the doggies are gone, then sometimes I mean, it's one of the best fishermen I know swears by using glow beads, so it, it works for him. I I don't I really find that they attract a lot of dogfish. If I'm if I'm attracting a lot of dogfish to the wreck. The dogfish will very often compete with the blackfish for the bait. And sometimes if you pull up on a wreck and, and, and you can see the wreck on your screen and you can see life, you can see the you can see the blackfish around and you go down and you start catching them. But now you're attracting the dogfish and you can see the doggies starting to swarm the wreck. The blackfish bite will stop. They all get chased inside. Same thing happens with striped bass. If you're anchored up in a school of striped bass comes by, you start seeing them on the machine. A couple minutes later, you start seeing more and more stripers, and you can see all the life on the wreck just go bloop. It just gets absorbed right into the wreck. It's all hidden. Yeah. It's all hidden. Man, those those things are just such a <laughs> such pests. I I can't. I I wish I wish we could start a rumor that they're just awesome to eat and just everyone just started keeping them and eating them i actually i hate being on the boat with chris when i hear i'll hear someone say oh it's a dog like i heard a dogfish kit now i know he's just gonna start i think my eyes can we move pull the anchor can we move the boat like as soon as there's one dogfish the boat has to move me immediately (laughs) he just hates seriously when that happens fish fish a fish a whole crab Cut the legs off of it. Bait them up on a snafu rig. Don't even step on it. Just drop it in. Let it right get right to the bottom and do not move that bait. Do not lift it. Don't nothing. If you start getting a little tap, tap, don't move it. Wait till you get a good, a good womp, womp, womp. Once that fish is like pulling yeah. that rod out of your hands, hit them. Then you know you got a blackfish. So you now think let me, that, let... that tactic right there will kind of uh, settle down the dogfish, you think? That has worked? When you drop your bait in and you get a hit and you you swing and you miss, yeah, yeah, your sinker and bait comes off the bottom and then it flutters down to the bottom. The next bite you get is going to be a dogfish. Right. All right. But if if dogfish are, I'm sorry, like let's say, all right, let's say for whatever reason, maybe some guy, let's say you're on a party boat and the next four guys down from you have never done it before and they're not listening to anyone and they're doing that and they're attracting these dogfish in is is are you just screwed or do you think if i then do what you just said with the whole crab the legs cut off on the double on the double hook rig and i don't move it you think i can you know avoid the dogfish maybe and and i do want to try to get away from them i want to try to go up to the bow maybe to the other side of the boat if i'm really stuck there with them and they're dropping straight down. I'm going to flip out away from the boat. I'll flip my bait out like 40, 50 feet and, and, and let it kind of settle out there and try to get away from them a little bit. Yeah. Let me ask Let me ask about the actual bait itself. Uh, every time I've ever been to the tackle shop to pretty much get us bait to go black fishing, it's always been green crabs. Mm-hmm. Uh, I've heard you mention the white leggers a few times already. I know there's a couple other bait options as well. Uh, what is your, you have a preference? Do you switch around? Or the first couple of weeks of the year, um, like mid-November, mid-November, last week in November, green crabs are just fine because we're mostly fishing 50, 60, 75 foot of water. We're not really fishing for big fish yet. We're just kind of getting warmed up. Once that once that fishing uh, once it gets to be around like december 1st and the water keeps getting colder and colder we'll switch over to using white crabs the bad thing with that is if we're on a boat and me and you are using green crabs and you you're not getting bit so chris you start using white crabs 
a lot of times you'll start getting bit and you'll start catching fish and the fish will turn on the white crabs and they'll really lay off the green crabs. Really? Yeah. Like so that. this is what, and the same, the same thing will happen if we're using white crabs and Chris, you pull out hermits and you start fishing hermit crabs. Don't get on them hermit crabs and they don't want anything else. And hermit crabs are just, they're, they're just obnoxious to try to fish with. They're so soft. <laughs> So now I, you have you have all three with you when you're heading out? No. The reason I fish on these charter boats that I fish on is because they're excellent with the bait. They usually all catch their own bait or buy their own bait. So they usually always have green crabs early, and then maybe they have white crabs, but they're not really so necessary. And then very quickly it'll turn into an all-white crab thing until the season ends, like mid-January, late-January. And if everyone is on the same page, then it's not going to be a big deal, right? If but if you're on like an open boat, and and one guy like pulls out, starts pulling out white crabs out of his pocket, and no one else has them, he could screw up the whole bite for everyone else. And and that's fair. I mean, I I been I've been on that before. I've been on the other side of that. I was you had the white crabs. You had the white crabs in your pocket. How you doing? <laughs> no holds barred. I, I'm, I've been on boats. I'm just in the back of the boat catching fish, bro. I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> I've been on boats where they'll have both kinds of crabs and they'll say, oh, no one touches the white crabs until we, you know, everyone uses the green crabs. Once we see what's going on and then, you know, we'll go from <laughs> there. They don't kind of, it's not just, you know. Not like a free for all, but I guess if you could like walk by and just slip some into your pocket, you could screw the guys next. <laughs> I like this guy catching dogfish for four hours, getting hit in the feet with seven pound blackfish. That's great. Swear to God, swear to God, can't make this up, man. Oh, I I believe you hundred percent. And because he was busting Mark so bad, because he was like kind of giving him a hard time first about the green crabs and about the. Then about the red sinker, uh, it just, you know, karma just took care of him. <laughs> There's nothing better than that. It's great. That's why uh, I, just, I just try to keep my mouth shut in, in any situation like that. I, I don't I don't need it to come back and bite me in the ass later. Me too. That whole day, Mark and I, we didn't say a word. Mark's is over near. Mark's in like the, uh, he's in the starboard corner and I'm in the port next to the house and he's just giving me this smirk every time I'm throwing fish down there. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of funny. No, that's well, awesome. I don't know how I'm going to, uh, how exactly I break this to Chris without like really upsetting him, but he has to realize this episode does have to eventually end. No, I'm not done talking to Frank yet. I know you're not, but you can't keep him forever. He has to go back to his life. So Frank, how much time you got? You got like two hours left? <laughs> I got some time. We started late, didn't we? Yeah, Joe, you were stuck in traffic. You wasted my first 15 minutes. Okay, go Why ahead. Like I'm not, Joe, I'm not rushing problem. you. I'm just telling you, you can't keep him. You have to give him back before this night's over. Joe's just mad because I'm not talking about smallmouth. No, please don't anything. I don't want that. Good, because I don't know what I'm talking about. Good. <laughs> you know, I I don't talk to many people that only saltwater fish. You've never freshwater fished, or when you were a kid, you must have. Oh, yeah. I have a pond um a block away behind my house. I just took my neighbor's kids over there the other night. We were I was fly fishing, caught a couple little bass. It was a lot oh. of fun. But it's not my passion. It's not it's not what I'm no, doing. No, no, I am let me ask you this. Frank, we, we recently just did an episode where we did the strongest fighting freshwater fish, and we had a poll. We said we might f uh, f in the future do a saltwater one. Is it even worth my time with pound for pound in that? Because uh, is anything going to even touch a blackfish pound for pound? Tarpon, bluefin, pound for pound? bluefin We're talking tuna on the fly. You want uh, just New Jersey fish though, right, Joe? We're talking just New Jersey fish. I'm talking pound for pound. I would say I would say um, one day we went out and we were throwing peanut bunker at the ridge, and I was catching I was catching schooly bluefin tuna on ten weight fly gear. That was a blast. <laughs> that was an absolute blast. And wow. at the end, and <laughs> that's crazy. Yeah, it was. We were actually we were trolling, and as soon as we caught one, we were reeling it in towards the boat. 
and it was bringing the school of fish with us and we started throwing handfuls of live peanut bunker once we got the other the other lines cleared and we kept throwing the peanut bunker and the fish realized the boat was the source of the food we started throwing fly gear okay now i was using i think i was using an an able an able 10 weight nine foot rod and i was using a tibor gulf stream 10 weight reel nice stuff there was another guy he was using uh, like a reddington outfit and there was another guy he was using like an entry level outfit the en the guy with the entry level outfit he got bit the fish took off in about five seconds the drag locked up, and i'm watching it i'm watching the reel lose the reel's losing it the drag locks up the reel rips off of the reel foot Pulls, rips off a stripper guide and takes the top of his rod. And in about a half a second, he's standing there with a half a rod in his hand. The other guy with the middle range outfit, he um, he caught fish the rest of the day. But at the end of the day, it was smoked. Me, me I, I used my T-bore for another, you know, for a whole bunch of years. Eventually, I kind of stopped fly fishing in salt water because I did a lot of it. And it was really an inefficient way to catch fish. So. I, I agree. Fly fishing is very inefficient. <laughs> but it's a hoot, man. One day I caught, I think I caught um, a bonita, a false albacore, and a bluefin on fly all on the same day. It was very cool. <laughs> That's awesome. Jesus. That sounds like, like a dream Joe had. Why aren't you fly fishing for saltwater fish? I have Joe? never even taken a fly rod to the saltwater, ever. So you're one. like obsessed with fly fishing for stocked rainbow trout. Why haven't you done real fishing with it? I like brown trout. Eh, whatever. Yeah. You ever surf fish for stripers with the with the fly rod? I never have touched salt water with a fly rod. I've never even fished a lake with a fly rod. Only a river, the only thing I ever done. Man, I you get a thirty five pound bass on the fly in the surf. Ooh. Oh yeah, I mean. I, I don't have any like friends or anyone who does that kind of stuff. What about what about when the stripers come up for the spawn and stuff? Fly fish? Why don't you try fly fishing for them then? That's got to be insane. I guess I'd have to buy like a saltwater outfit, right? Like a ten weight, nine or ten. Yeah, you ha you have a what do you have? Don't you have a nine for the salmon and steelhead? I do. You yeah, just, you just need a different line, probably. I don't know how long does it have to be, Frank. I like nine nine footers. Sometimes a ten from the surf. I used a nine. I used a ten foot nine weight in the surf that I liked. But fishing from the boat, I was using a nine or a ten weight or a twelve weight nine footer. So if you went out, if you, if you went out there like right now, out into Raritan Bay, where you could walk across the stripers almost, mm -hmm. what do you th like? They have like big striper flies that you strip in. Oh yeah. Sure, there's all That's kind of there's flies answer. that look like bunker that are like eight nine inches long. I would yeah, probably just hard. tie a real long deceiver. I would probably just tie like a real long deceiver, maybe some maybe some green on the top, and, and um, you know, white hackle and white belly and little. This bit of was supposed. This was supposed to be a black fishing episode. Now it's costing yeah. me hundreds of dollars in fly fishing gear. Uh, How did we how did our black fishing episode turn into fly fishing episode? Multifaceted individuals. Oh, uh, we're all we're all about that, Frank, for sure. Um, Once you've been quick. fishing for a while, you you do some crazy stuff. You know what I mean? Oh yeah, we know. I mean, Joe's been fishing longer than me. I, I've I've been fishing for about fifteen or sixteen years, and I'm I'm already do some crazy stuff, but. Uh, <laughs> Um, I want to I want to just jump back real quick um, on the blackfish front. Uh, one of our big things with this whole podcast and, and the groups we started and stuff is uh, we really want to give the opportunity to people to try new stuff, maybe stuff that they didn't know existed, stuff that they know existed, but were nervous to try something new and, and whatnot. Uh, we just did it our last episode. We had um, the owner and creator of uh, Signal 11 Lures makes deer scents as well as fish attractants and stuff like that. But, you know, one of the part of that was if someone watching wanted to get into hunting, it's just 
another avenue for them. So what I'm getting at is if someone's listening to this or watching this and they're either a freshwater fisherman or a saltwater guy that hasn't tried black fishing yet, um, if, if you were talking to them, what would you say to them as far as maybe gear wise or boat wise or, uh, initial general tactics wise to kind of set them at ease and, and get them to break through that initial nervousness and, and try going, go black fishing, give it a try, see, see what's going on. Sure. Well, being a little bit of a purist, I mean, it's really nice to fish with a jig. But to be a purist, there's going to be days when you're not going to be able to fish the jig. You're going to be in 100, 130 foot of water. It's not jig territory. I would really want to set somebody up with a conventional rod. Um, some kind of a, it doesn't have to be a giant reel, but it has to be very strong. It has to have a strong foot. Something with like 50 pound braided line. And the rod has to be able to handle like a 10 ounce weight and, and a pretty good size crab. So something that will hold the weight and that the tip won't collapse. You know, you want something that when you when you lift that crab up, you want that tip to, you know, you want it to give a little bit, but you don't yeah. want it, you don't want the tip to bend over. Does that make sense? That's right. just, that's like a right. slow a slow action tip, right? Well, I don't think it necessarily has to be slow action. It's it's more of a it'd probably be more of a like a well, musky series rod, something like that. I, I think those might be a little. I I actually tried to use uh, a Saint Croix musky rod, like a, a a rod that musky fishermen, you know, that's what they use. Like, hey, get this Saint Croix musky rod. I actually tried to use that once black fishing, and it the tip wasn't doing what you're describing like you want it to do. It's mm -hmm. kind of too stiff almost yeah even even with that that 10 even with like a heavier eight or ten inch uh ounce sinker it kind of the whole thing kind of bent but i think if i'm hearing you correctly you you just kind of want you want that tip to go a little bit and then when you're fighting the fish you want the whole parabolic exactly and the thing is too with with black fishing the whole the whole moment of truth comes from the first part of black fishing and why it makes people crazy is trying to figure out when you're getting bit that you should set the hook because the blackfish yeah. are they're very curious so they'll come up and you'll get a little scratch bite you'll get it sometimes you'll get a little tap 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 and then yeah. it'll stop for a couple minutes and sometimes if the fishing's slow they'll come up and they'll suck the the guts out of your crab and then they won't touch that crab again. You you rebate, you throw it down, they'll come down and scratch, 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 scratch. They'll suck the guts out. You put new bait down again. It might take you 10 minutes, 15 minutes before that fish will finally get excited enough where he'll commit to giving you a, a good tug, you know, where he'll eat that bait the right way. And again, this has to do with current. It has to do with the excitement level of the fish. One of the worst things I've seen that'll put blackfish off a bite is extended periods of high pressure. If you have just bluebird sky for like four or five days in a row, day two, day three could be a mad dog bite. All of a sudden, day four, you won't get a sniff. Extended hmm. periods of high pressure will really mess with them. I never heard that one. That's interesting. Yeah. Now that's the truth, brother. Oh, especially I'm down that deep, too. Yeah. I noticed that one day when I was fishing in the back bay behind Margie, we were fishing shallow, it was inshore, but I fished, I fished Sunday, I fished Monday, it was insane, just lights out, couldn't keep a bait on the bottom. I took a friend Tuesday, exact same day, time, same spot, he got one bite, I got one bite, in like six hours fishing, we literally would not even get a tack. The next day it rained. The day after that was Thursday. We went down there. Fish were all over the place again. So extended periods of high pressure will mess up fish if they're in short. More about the rod. I'm kind of spoiled when it comes to the rods because I design rods for century fishing rods. Yeah. yeah. So I was able to design that that blank called the Century Pro Togger. We we made it specifically for for targeting trophy blackfish. Right. 
and it's all the little details of the rod. It's the handle, the foregrip. It has a it has a pretty short butt. It's only like twelve inches long, but the rod seven foot ten inches. So when you do when you you know when you're fishing a slack line, when you're fishing for blackfish, you're just kind of sitting there nice and relaxed. Mm-hmm. All of a sudden, you get a good hit. Instead of taking yourself out of position, instead of taking the rod and going, oh, I got him. Now the rod's up in the air. Now you have to take this hand off of the butt of the rod. So now you're holding the rod in the air with a foregrip with one hand. Yeah. And you're going to have to take this hand off to put it on the handle. Now you're reeling up here. Like, what exactly is that? So what I do when I'm black fishing is when I'm fishing a slack line, all that I do is I lift this hand towards my chest. I push this hand, I push the butt down in front of me. Now the rod is is in front of my hip. The foregrip is right here. I immediately get on the reel and crank that fish as fast as I can to get him off the bottom. If it's a big fish, when he stops me and he's sitting there, I am in such a powerful position, the way my rod is locked in, that that rod will just fold over and boom, it'll just hold that fish while he's dogging. Yeah. Because... You're swinging an eight foot rod and you're getting on the reel. You really have that fish close to 15, 15, 20 foot off the bottom before he even knows what hit him. So if you're locked in, if you're in that real powerful position, you have a great chance of catching some huge fish. Yeah. And, uh, and there's that, this may not seem that important to someone that doesn't do a lot of black fishing, but for someone like me, that's, you know, still learning, especially in comparison to someone like you that's been fishing all this time, it makes a big difference on a bigger fish. It may not make as big of a difference on a regular size fish, but if you start, I've lost a lot of fish that very well could have been really big fish. And I've caught a few too, but the ones you lose kind of stick in your mind more so because you wonder, well, what the hell could I have done differently? Is there nothing I could have done? And usually the answer is there is something you could have done. And mm-hmm. it may be something as simple as what you just described in that scenario. Mm-hmm. How many people do you see black fishing and you're talking about small conventional reels and they have their hand behind the reel? They're holding the rod with one end. They have their hand behind the reel. Yeah. If I yeah. go to the tip of that yeah. rod, I'll just go boop. You, you are not in a powerful position. Where is, no. Now, if you get a 15-pound fish, you eat that crab, and it goes, whoop, guess what you're going to go, and, oh, yeah. oh, lost them again. Well, you know Frank, what? I've seen guys, just, on, I've you know seen what my seen guys on boats after so many years. You'll always see a guy on a boat, and he's a guy, and he's been doing it, and he fishes a lot, and maybe he doesn't tie the right knot, or maybe he's using a, a 10-year-old spool of top shot line. Or maybe there's something that he's doing the same way he always do it. I've seen guys, they, oh, they get bit. Oh, they set the hook. Oh, I got him on. Oh, oh. Then they, they, okay, so now they're up in the air. Now they lower the rod and they start, so they lower, they lower the rod. The fish swims into the hole and they start to crank. Oh, he got me again. You ever seen that that one, Joe? Yeah, Yeah, unfortunately I have. Uh, you know, just I, so I just want him to teach you uh, while we have him here. What side of the spinning reel is your handle on, Frank? This is Why are you I, taking I me into this bad place? place? What's that, Frank? I, I'm I'm making a joke. I will say this: my fly reel, I always reeled with my right hand because I'm right-handed. My spinning reel, I always reel with my left hand. Because left. I'm right-handed. And what and what side is your conventional on? Right hand. So right on conventional, left on spinning. Chris. Now, no, no. Wants- now let me ask, Frank. Do you fight the fish, though, with the rod in your left hand the whole time? Yep. Okay. Now I'm let me totally- throw something else at you. Remember we were talking about catching bluefin tuna and fly gear? Yeah. I reel with my right hand because I'm right-handed. So I have very good muscle memory and coordination with my right hand. 
When I threw that fly out and that fish took off and I got him on the reel, I'm holding the rod with my left hand. I'm palming the reel with my right hand. When that fish turned and, turn and swam to me, I'm so quickly able to turn with the right hand for a long period of time because I'm right-handed. If I'm holding it left-handed, and some guys, they want to use the left hand because that's how they do their spinning rod. If you're right-handed and you're telling me you're going to turn with the same coordination with your left hand, I can't do that. You're not, that's why you're right-handed. If you're better coordinated with your other hand. What I'm saying is something with a fly gear where it's not even a multiplying reel. These are the kind of things where you really got to get your head on straight. You, straight. You got to have your game like ready. You know, your mission specific to catch this fish. It has nothing to do with the, whether you're more comfortable reeling with this hand or somebody told you to do that. Do it the right way, bro. You know what I mean? Yeah, but you're casting with you're casting the fly rod with your right right hand, correct? Yep. Yep. How are you getting your right hand your casting hand to the reel faster than I am on the left side? Paul cast when it's out there, I'm holding the rod with the right hand and I'm stripping with my left hand. When I get a hit, I strip, I come up, I clear the line onto the reel, and then I switch to the left hand and I reel with the right hand. The whole time I'm casting, I'm not touching my reel. I'm only hand, I'm handing the rod with the right hand and I'm stripping with the left hand. When I get a hit, I strip strike it. If the fish is big enough, he clears the line off the deck. Now the now the fish is on the reel. Now I grab the foregrip with my left hand and I reel with my right hand. What he's saying makes sense, but I can't justify it because it's sacrilegious. Okay, but I don't want to talk about it. So back to the... Okay, so Joe's trying to bust my chops because I like my conventional and low-profile bait casting reels. I, I have the reel on the left. Mm -hmm. I'm a righty. So this doesn't... Uh, translate into black fishing as much because you're not working a lure but if i'm working a lure that's why i want the rod in my right hand i want to be able to work that lure with my dominant hand and arm so i i'm working the lure with my right hand and then i'm reeling with the left i'm used to reeling with the left because the spinning reel and it just felt right to me when i first started using them i i got a left-handed one it felt right it's never failed me um, the only downside that's actually a plus side to me is that no one's going to touch my shit because it's on the op opposite side. But what I was going to say is uh, my personal favorite weird thing that people do is, OK, mo so most people have the conventional with the reel on the right like you guys, but they don't fight. They don't want they don't. They don't want to hold the rod with their left hand. So they'll hold the rod with their right hand, get that. They're waiting for that bite. And this is black. So we're talking black fishing. They want to hold the rod. They want to set the rod with their right hand up top. So they're holding it with their right hand. They get the bite. They set the hook and then switch. I do do that. That's what I do. That makes no fucking sense to me. <laughs> uh, for me, for me, there, when you're a black fisherman, you're going to reach a point in time where you're going to really get pissed off at losing big fish. And you're going to, something's going to switch in your head. And me, the way I fight a fish, I, I bait for fish, I, I hook fish, I fight fish, I land fish. Everything is in preparation for when it's a large fish. Everything is, it, it's all just good habits. It's the way I set the hook, the way I get on the reel really quick. I actually had a guy tell me, well, I'm just setting the hook like that. And if it's a big fish, I'll do it this way. But if it's a little fish, I'm doing it that way. I'm like, <laughs> let me know how that works out for you. By the time you figure out how big that fish is, it's way too late, bro. Oh, yeah. You know, you have, you have a very short window. By the time you put that hook in that fish's face before he knows something's wrong. So if you can move him off that wreck and have that rod locked in, I'm not talking about 10 pounders. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about really, really big fish. 
there's got to be a certain amount of luck, but there has to be a certain amount of skill and wherewithal involved too. You don't just go out there and, and land fish that are that large because you're just, you know, yeah, I'm just going out black fishing and I'm using my sunny rod and, you know, it's like, oh, no. <laughs> they're going to own you very quickly. Yeah. Well, and, and, and jumping back to the, you know, someone just getting started in this, um, I kind of wanted to throw in, like, I, I can remember, I'm sure you even remember the, it's been a long time, right? But you, I bet you remember your first black fishing trip. Um, and I remember mine and I knew nothing about it. I went with my buddy, uh, who's passed now and he's like, oh, you got to try black fishing. It, it's awesome. Uh, and I'm like, yeah, no, I'm down for anything. And I remember, and I just, I'm like, what do I need? Well, like, what should I bring? Do you have something for? He's like, no, nah, I don't have an extra one. He's like, just bring, you know, whatever. He's just like, bring, bring your. Uh, I think I used like a lighter musky rod or something at that point. And I brought, and I can just remember, I I caught some fish that day, no keepers. I think I caught like four or five shorts. I think we were on, uh, I think we we're on Captain Ron's fisherman, and uh, and I just can remember trying to figure out what the hell was going on with that bite right and it's just like i'm like well i'm, I'm getting nibbled he's like well don't set on the nibble don't sound and i'm waiting and i'm waiting and, and then you feel a little bit something more and you swing and you miss and you're just like no oh, it's it's small fish no no and and people are trying to explain to you well it's not necessarily a small fish they're doing you know what you were talking about before frank just you know sucking the the meat out and or chomping little pieces off of it and, and and you're not sure and there's really no way to explain it to someone and for them to totally understand it right then and there with your words it's something that you have to just do and keep doing and feel and remember and just keep doing you really kind of zone out when you're doing it too like i get I'm I'm really into it, and I'm you know I'm sitting there chatting and whatever, but I'm sitting there holding that rod and I'm fishing a slack line, and his boat's going down. I'm not I'm not bouncing that sinker, and I'm nice and relaxed, and we're all talking and having fun. And all of a sudden, I get a good tap, and it's like, oh wait! All of a sudden, I get real quiet. It's kind of it's like okay, <laughs> time to and you know, and then it's time to it's time to fish, and uh, it becomes like a second nature. Right. Yeah, yeah. But it, so if so, but it, to someone just learning, I guess my point is uh, to not get discouraged about what's going to happen because chances are you're going to get embarrassed by this fish for a pretty good amount of time before you start figuring out what the hell's going on, and uh, just just know that it if you keep at it and and you you will get the hang of it. It's not it's not like it's luck after a certain point it's not just like well i'll 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 swing on every third nibble or fourth mm -hmm. nibble like it's something i think, that the, I think the key is you've re, you know you you have to try to there's a lot of self-proclaimed world's best black fishermen on facebook just ask any of them they'll all tell you <laughs> uh, me personally i, I don't want to be the dude that tells anybody i'm anything i'm just like i said i started this off i'm just a regular guy man i haven't fished much and i only fished a couple trips this summer you know why my dog passed in february we just got a new puppy right. in the middle of june we just had grandson number two in california three weeks ago my wife and i were out there for 10 days we came home. We were home for three days, and then we had to go to Terrain up in Devon, PA, because my son got married up there. And now, all of a sudden, we're home, and it's like, all right, we're all done. But between the dog and the new grandson, and you know what? I really couldn't, I really couldn't bring it to my head to kind of disconnect and say, oh, yeah, I'm going to Cuddy Hunk this year for a week. You know what I mean? I'll do yeah. that next year so my wife don't kill me in my sleep. <laughs> But just in time for blackfish season now, the dog's trained. He's a good boy, and we're ready to, you know, we're ready to get back into in the normal fishing season. Hey, it it seemed like it's working out for you just in time for black fishing season. Like you said, uh, it's uh, black fishing season in New Jersey opens November seventeenth, right? Yeah. But you gotta so try to you gotta try to find somebody that you can communicate with that'll share information with you, who's not like 
goofy. You know, like they, they have to really want to share with you. I mean, we, we've all heard guys talk about black fishing and they say, oh, yeah, you got to you gotta set the hook just before they hit the bait. And it's like, what does that even mean? Bro? I've it's never like, heard that one before. <laughs> oh, yeah, it's an old, oh, you, you got to set it just, just while they're looking at it. You got to set the hook. It's like, I, I don't even know. It, you well, know it's, I've it's like people are sometimes people are like, you know, they think they're being funny, but they're just being like coy. You know, it's like, I don't really get it. Well, I, I also know a lot of uh, old school guys that kind of get stuck in their old ways, like real stubborn type guys. Mm -hmm. And it makes me kind of cringe when I see them trying to teach someone who's learning mm -hmm. and they kind of just disregard any new information that's come on the scene. Like I, I've seen guys like trying – Oh, you braid is so stupid. Like you got to use mono for everything. I'm like, bottom fishing. You're using mono still. Oh yeah, that braid is is use like, like stuff like that. And it makes me cringe when those types of guys are passing information on to to new anglers. Now me, uh, I need I need braid. Okay, braid's the single biggest innovation that happened in our industry in the last forty years. Braided fishing. I, I'm not going to argue that is the most important thing. It changed everything about it. But the best black fishermen I, I – some of the best black fishermen I know use 50-pound Andy Mono. Really? Straight, no breed. But these aren't regular people. Guys like Jerry Posterino. If you want to consider him a regular fisherman, you, you're out of your mind. Wait, Jerry doesn't use braid for bottom fishing? Straight up, 50-pound Andy Mono. What? <laughs> That's great. Really? Keep in mind, when you use mono, you don't feel the little tiny, the little tiny scratchy peckies that you shouldn't be setting up on anyway. Okay. You don't even feel, you don't even feel them. So when you're using, when you do get a big fish hit, you can really feel it. But years back when I was using 30 pound mono on my bottom fishing gear, when we first went out to the deep water and we started catching big fish with 30 pound mono, there was so much stretch in the mono between the soft rod and the mono. I set the hook and tried to reel in the fish and the fish would just go rrr, 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 and he yeah. would literally swim right down into the wreck. There was just so much stretch. And at the time I was trying to figure out what black fishing was like. And I was like, man, I just got <laughs> smoked on that trip. <laughs> That's when I came home and I had a custom rod built and that rod with my with my pen squitter, I still have it. It weighs four and a half pounds. Four wow. and a half pounds. Okay. <laughs> Shit. The pro the pro togger with the rod and reel weighs one pound ten ounces. Rod and reel. The pro you, togger itself weighs not nine point six ounces. You'd need biceps like Joe to fish that old school rod. Okay. I swear to God, that was when braid was just coming out. Well, I, yeah, I didn't start. Fishing. It's so much extra drag on the. I mean, like, mm -hmm. there's so much more friction between the water and the line, though. It drags it up off the bottom. You need more yep. weight to hold. It's just it's total pain in the ass. I can't believe Pastorino uses that. Crazy. That's crazy. I'll bet you put any fisherman against them. I'll I'll bet on Jerry. Oh, I, I'm, I'll, I'll bet, bet on him grand. too. I, I, I just I can't make sense of right now. I don't even care what species or anything. It doesn't matter. I'm, I'm not putting, I don't know anyone I'd put up and, or bet at least. I will face him in uh walleye. <laughs> <laughs> fresh. I've seen him do some freshwater fishing. I don't know about walleye. He? I see, he, Exceptionally he, skilled guy, man. And believe me to think if you watch him long enough, the things that he says, doesn't even compare to the innate ability he has to read the conditions and to know his waters. He knows what the conditions are in his waters between like Sandy Hook and Barnegat and out 20 miles. He knows what the conditions are. If, the, if it's like this here, he knows it's like that there. He's just an amazingly skilled guy. And he's kind of younger. You would expect him to be much older. He's kind of younger to know so much. Mm -hmm. All right. Incredibly yeah. hardworking. And you can't you can't convey that stuff 
to other people. Like if, if someone wanted to learn from him, he, he couldn't just tell you, like you have to experience this over and over and over again. Like it's, it's all it's experience, but it's also, you can't just the experience itself. Isn't enough. Like he has something about him where he refuses to stop learning, remembering and, and like putting puzzle pieces together or something like that. Mm-hmm. It, it's crazy. But he thinks your name is Frankel. And, and he you probably deserve it. Hmm? All right. So, uh, Frank, we're actually going to let you go. I think, uh, we don't want to take up your entire night, but, I will say we, we I I mean I could talk to you forever about black fishing. Um you you invited us down to, to come on one of your trips in uh December, uh which I'm super stoked about. I, Joe, are you able I'm not sure if Joe's able to make that. He might have had prior engagements, I'm not sure. I hope so. See? I don't know, we'll figure it out. I'll be coming, uh and someone else will be coming with me and uh I'm excited as hell to blackfish with you and you could uh, talk to him all day there until he gets a bite then he stops talking <laughs> i don't it's funny because i don't even mean to do that it's just what you did the folk you know you get so focused on what's going on frank so if if he suddenly gets real quiet on the boat we know that something's tugging i'm not even going to talk to you that day frank i'm just going to watch every little thing you do it's going to be creepy as hell Dude, you know what's seriously, you know what's going on? When you're on a boat with six guys, you know, you know what each guy, what each guy's rig looks like. You know what each guy's using for bait. You can tell by their mannerisms if they're getting hits, if they're not getting hits. You you know because you fish with these guys all the time. So there's all I'm these not, are the things I'm that, not I'm not the getting on the really boat. don't have to talk thing. about, you know. I'm, I'm not getting on the boat with red sinkers, so I need red sinkers now, or I'm not going. Are you making fun of me? Am I going to have to put you no, in the corner I'm not to catch sinks all day? After he, I'm, if I don't have red sinkers, I'm not going fishing. No, I want them. He's dead serious, Frank. He's you got in his head. He's gonna. That's it. When he gets off of this right now. He's gonna go into his garage and paint all his sinkers red. I'm never going black fishing ever again without red sinkers. You have ever. no idea what you did to his mind. <laughs> I swear, to, I swear to God, if I could just leave them in salt water for a couple of weeks and they would turn gray, I wouldn't bother to paint them. But that- send us a uh, link of the red paint I have to buy. I'll get it on Amazon. Red, red plastic dip spray. Plastic dip spray. Red. Plasti- right. Yeah. Frank, I really Frank appreciate you coming on. I I know he wants to stay here with you, but. I don't, if you guys want to continue a private phone call later, I want to watch the jet game. Uh, okay. But I really do appreciate five minutes. Don't ever give them your number, Frank. Just email them. There you have it. You guys were a lot of fun. Thanks for having me on. It was a hoot. Thank you, Frank. Frank it was awesome talking to you. Uh, we'll talk to you again soon, and we'll see you in December. Thanks, guys. See you. Take care. Yeah, I had actually, I had offered the trip with him to Katie uh, because Mikey K was throwing an RVTA trout fishing tournament, but now he's changed the date of the trout tournament, so I have to try to fight her for my spot back. I mean, that uh, sounds like a Joe problem. And I don't know, hopefully, if you could... Well, hopefully you could somehow help me. Like, tell her it's going to be freezing and the fish ain't biting. Make something up. She knows it's going to be torturous, but I mean... I, all I know is I'm I'm going. It's going to be awesome. Uh, I'm getting as many black fishing trips in as I can this year. Last year was kind of rough. Up. If I don't up. get to go, I blame Mike. <laughs> Fair enough. Uh, I did miss some fishing mentions before. Uh, you went fishing. Uh, I got I went to Lake Parsippany with all of them. I already complained about that. You went fishing. Uh, Katie Lynn took a bunch of you guys carp fishing. I won't name the lake she took you guys to. Uh, your Katie caught a 19 pound mirror carp, uh, sax mad. It looks like caught a nice carp. A couple nice carp were caught except for you. I didn't see holding anything. Well, I saw a picture of you sleeping on. Well, a- here's, here's the, what happened. All right. I 
did not necessarily want to go carp fishing after I worked overtime and then into the night. They went around me and they asked Katie if she wanted to go and she jumped all over it. So then I got and I got tried to get they were trying to rope me into it. Um and I said, Look guys, I only carp fish with sax mat. <laughs> so they turned and they invited sax mat and I put my foot in my mouth and then I had to go. So but no I, I do appreciate the invite. It's it's a cool fishery uh with a lot of mirror carp which are which are really cool looking. Um I I did just fall asleep face down on one of the benches there, uh, which is the only picture you'll find of me from that night because I didn't catch anything. No. Uh, We have to start to wrap this up. Uh, The prizes keep do getting donated for the NJF Mayhem Christmas Party. Uh, There are a pretty good list of donated prizes already for it. yeah. I don't think those oh. tickets are available though yet publicly, but they will be soon. Yeah, and you know what? There's only going to be about I want to say there's only going to be about twenty to twenty five spots yeah. left uh, when the official post goes out because a lot of people uh, kind of pre-ordered them. VIP list. Uh, uh, I wouldn't say they they pre-ordered. I mean, well, we wanted to make sure that anyone who's of you know, the old school NJF uh, got first dibs to get in there and yeah. then uh, first dibs for like the guys who, you know, contribute a lot to the mayhem pages and, and our community and stuff. So, yeah, there's only going to be about 20 or 25 spots left when it goes up. And yeah, I'm not- if you're if you're watching this and you really are interested in going to the Christmas party and me and Chris like you, send me a message. We could probably help you uh, get one. Yeah, and I mean, if we is, don't like you, now probably we're say well, we're This kind of goes back to what we've said before. Like, if you're just creeping in these fishing groups and you're not contributing any anything, no one's gonna know who you are when you want something, information, or you want to be a part of something and you're not recognized like you're going to get passed over. So and and I'm not going to go through the list of prizes and stuff now, but we got all kinds of like open boat trips, uh guided yeah, trips. There 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 is a lot of good prizes. Yeah, and if anyone listening to this would like to donate something, uh, some kind of fishing gear or a little prize package of some sort or or a gift card or anything like that, uh Reach out to us or, or reach out to, to Jerry Zagorski at njfishing.com and uh, you know we'll we'll get that donation on there too. The the list can be as long. The more donations we have for the prizes for the raffle, the more tickets people buy for the raffle, and then the more money that we can donate to Heroes on the Water New Jersey chapter. Uh yeah, all the money, all the proceeds from this party are going to be donated to Heroes on the Water. Uh, other than that, next week's guest, I think, are the Kennedy couple, correct? Uh, yeah, Kevin and Sandy Kennedy. Next are... week is the Kennedy couple from down in South Jersey. Uh, big snakehead uh, fisher anglers. I can't say fishermen all the time. Uh, you the say females. Yeah, I got to I got to get used to saying angler. I use the word fisherman too much. The anglers. Uh, they're an angling couple from South Jersey Pine Barrens. They catch a lot of snakeheads. Uh, they post a lot of fish, very active on social media, so that should be cool. Yeah, real cool uh, people. Totally different region of New Jersey. If you have any questions for them, for the Kennedy, Sandy Kennedy, she's I think she's Jersey Girl Fishing on Instagram. Uh, yeah, that sounds right. Yeah, I'm pretty sure that's her. Uh, they do post a lot on social media. Any questions for them, email us. We'll ask them. Any questions for us, email us. Uh, hit that subscribe button. I have to say that. Uh, and once again, we appreciate all the support that the podcast has been getting over the past few weeks. Uh, it's really been awesome. Uh, we will be back next week. Uh, have a good week, and hopefully everyone catches some fish. Yeah, get out there. Get out there, guys, and suffer for those fish. If the weather sucks, suffer through it. Catch some fish. Let's see those fish. See you next week. Later.